nature of this program. Viewer discretion is advised. You're listening to Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, an audiobook by Christopher Colon. All rights reserved. Any resemblance to persons living or dead are purely coincidental. Chapter 2 At parties, I always seem to end up telling stories from my time on the road. Whenever I'm with friends, somebody invariably will want me to recount some story that they've heard about me, either from myself or through somebody else. I guess I just have some good tales to tell. I'm not a narcissist. Like right now, I'm just writing this because some friends of mine, said it would be a good idea to get some some of my adventures down on paper, or in this case onto a computer. For the record. I took them up on that challenge. Mind you, I'm no writer. I'm a musician. So with the help of my Muse 2.0 laptop computer, hopefully I'll be able to get this tale out without too many grammatical errors or spelling mistakes. When a cover band tries to decide on a name, they try to use some variation of a song or album title of the band they are covering. You try not to make it too obscure or nobody will get it. But then again, when you do choose an obscure name, it's a wink to the more hardcore fans. It's proof that you aren't some fair weather fan, by choosing some obvious name, that's probably taken already. My band called itself the Lunatics Dungeon, after one of Gateway Drug's better known songs, The Dungeon of Lunacy. That kind of wordplay, lets anybody who happens to see our name on a poster or promotional flyer, that we are a Gateway Drug cover band, even if our set wasn't exclusively Gateway Drug. Our singer, Corey, suffers from what's commonly known in the business as LSD. No, not acid the drug. LSD stands for lead singer's disease. Some people are naturally charming have a real presence when they are on stage. But then there are people like Corey, who take that love that they get when they are performing, and expect the rest of the world to treat them like the rock and roll god they think they are, inside their heads, for the rest of the time when they are not on stage. I've been known to have a healthy ego, and for our business, that helps. Corey, well he is a rock star 24 hours a day. He expects star treatment, demands it. I've never deluded myself, that we are, at best, a small time band, which possibly only a couple of thousand of people have seen over the course of our years on the road. We are working on getting our names out there. Corey wants to skip the step altogether. He wants to jump straight to the let's trash the hotel room and throw the television out the window phase of our careers. We're not at that point yet, but you wouldn't know that, if you spoke our singer. Corey is enough of a rock star for all the rest of us. That's the job of being a front man. You're the one everybody is looking at, so I can see how that kind of attention could easily go to your head. As difficult as Corey can be, I'm the yin to his yang. Whenever he's out of control, people call on me to be the one to bring him back to this little thing we like to call reality. Out, of all the guys in the band, he's been with me the longest, since the beginning. He, only has one job, to sing. He doesn't play an instrument. He's never learned. But, in his defense, he does have the voice. Even with all the partying that he does, he always comes through when it comes to showtime. I secretly think that his own self-importance, won't allow him to put on a bad show. He couldn't live with himself, if someone said he didn't have the pipes. Appropriately, he does everything the exact opposite of what a singer is supposed to do to save their voice for their performance. He smokes like a chimney, and is constantly talking. Vocalists advise that you have to preserve your voice hours before the show by not talking. Not Corey, he never shuts up. I think he deeply loves the sound of his own voice, more than any of his fans. Besides, if it wasn't for our band being an avenue for Corey to exercise his ego, somewhere there would be a fast food restaurant, employing the world's most obnoxious burger flipper. I think we're doing the world a great public service by allowing Corey to do his thing on stage. Over the years, I've learned to tune him out. We've lost members of our band, because they just couldn't deal with Corey and his ego. He can be a little overwhelming. Once you understand that, it's part of his charm, you can learn to live with him. Just let him talk. Don't challenge him on his exaggerations. That's what I do. If Corey were to ever say the sky is purple my response would be, yes, and what a beautiful shade of purple it is. It just keeps the peace, and that what I'm all about. I just want harmony, in the music and in our lives. Don't rock the boat. It can be very grating on the nerves if you let it, and some people have walked away from the band because they just couldn't deal. I've always maintained my role as leader of the band. 
I do all the bookings, I make the major decisions. I make the set lists. And Corey doesn't step on my toes, when it comes to the behind the scenes stuff. He doesn't like dealing with what he likes to consider the frivolous part of the job. It's a boring job, but I don't mind doing it. But when we're doing an interview for some small time magazine, Corey comes across as the essential glue that holds our band together and the rest of the band would be lost without his guidance. I don't take it personally. Let him have his delusions of grandeur. At least he doesn't have a defeatist attitude. That kind of thinking, I will not tolerate. If you're not in it to win it, I don't want you on my team, and we've lost many a small-minded musician, without any real goals for fame. And good riddance to them. Corey may be a pain in the ass, but at least he has a vision for bigger and better things. We butt heads on more than a few occasions but Corey wants what's good for the band, because it's what's good for him. You got to give him at least that bit of credit. The band isn't just me and Corey. If I'm the brains and Corey is the balls, then Jimmy is the heart. Jimmy is the son of Colombian immigrants, and trust me over the years, we've have giving him a razzying on his background. From jokes about Juan Valdez, the mascot for the Colombian coffee company, to endless jokes about cocaine and drug cartels, synonymous with the Colombian criminal underworld. The worst part of it, is that Jimmy is one of the nicest guys you will ever meet and he doesn't make mean-spirited jokes. Yet he will take all the abuse that we hurl at him on a daily basis. Funny thing about his name is that is is not a nickname for the name James. His parents, unfamiliar with American culture, didn't know at the time when they were naming him that Jimmy was a nickname and not a proper name. And in trying to assimilate to their new homeland, Jimmy is the name on his birth certificate. Every time somebody unfamiliar with his situation, may call him James accidentally, he has to explain it to them. They were just trying to be respectful by calling him what the thought was his proper name, when in reality, it's Jimmy. Plain ANS simple. Jimmy plays the rhythm guitar. Much like his father, who also played the Spanish guitar, Jimmy has been taught ever since he was a child to play music. Because of his background, Jim listens to all sorts of music, other than heavy metal, but his heart is loyal to the music we play. There is a whole scene of Spanish music, that is rock and roll, and even though I may not know what they are saying, I love the vibe and the energy. American bands do very well in Spanish-speaking countries. Music really is universal. On drums, we have Raphael. Just ask the band Spinal Tap, drummers are a dime a dozen. Not that I don't love RAF, but he's got a personality of wallpaper. He's the anti Corey. He doesn't expect much. He doesn't talk much, and if you left alone in a room, without a book, or television, or dome other distraction, he would just sit there in his chair and stare blankly at the wall until something happened. The wall would come tumbling down, before he got out his chair, if somebody didn't tell him it's okay to get up and walk around. He's a natural born follower. He doesn't complain. He doesn't question authority. He just goes along with the rest of the group. I've always played with the idea of telling him we were all going to commit cult-like suicide, just see if he would object. I bet he wouldn't. After a long day of dealing with Corey's ego, Raphael is a breath of fresh air. Whenever we get a hotel room, for a gig I always try to pair up with RAF. He's quiet and won't disturb me while I'm practicing or trying to sleep. Put some sticks in Raphael's hands, and watch him come to life. Actually he doesn't need sticks either. With his bare hands, on a countertop, Raphael could blast out a beat that would get the dead to shake their asses. It's like he's a rain man or something. I think that there is a constant beat going on inside his head, and when he plays, he's letting the rest of us in on what's going on inside his cranium. He doesn't cause problems, and that alone makes him valuable on the road. Then there's Dimitri. I think it's the law, that all bass players have to be quirky and unusual. Dimitri fills that stereotype to the letter. Dima doesn't live in the same plane of existence as the rest of us. He lives inside the world of a Bugs Bunny slash Warner Bothers cartoon. Sometimes he'll just blurt out something so obscure, that you'll just stand there scratching your head asking what the hell did he just say. With Dima, life is a party, and he is completely and totally drug free. Not in the self-righteous sense, either. Dimitri is just naturally weird. I wouldn't like to see him get high, he doesn't need to. It's that weirdness that makes him such a great bass player. Dima could listen to a track just once and automatically play it verbatim. The kid is not normal, but he is a kick-ass bass player and nobody can take that away from him. 
I almost forgot to introduce myself. My name is Andre Costos Spiros. But you can call me Andy C.S or just plain Andy for short. I have one of those hyphenated last names that has come along with woman's lip. It's my mother's maiden name and my father's last name. But my father always told me you're a Spiros, and don't let anyone tell you different. It's your last name and the name of your proud father's family. He was always a little overly dramatic. I grew up in Ithaca, New York. I grew up in an area, that could best be described as economically, depressed. I was probably one of the only people in my neighborhood that lived with both his mother and his father under the same roof. I was a bit of a rarity. Some of my friends never knew their fathers, and for some that did know their dads, it wasn't much to brag about either. What was considered a traditional family wasn't traditional where we grew up. It's very easy to write off people who come from a poor area like I did. Some of my closest friends come from poor single parent homes and have turned out to be very respectable people. We weren't raised to be a statistic. My parents did their best to raise me right, and I even though I may have given them some grief as a young adult, I think I grew up to be a very decent human being. Even if I do like to get out there and have some fun. Please visit twostrangersonepodcast.net.